Hello and welcome to a panel hosted by Hudson Institute's China Center on China's growing influence in Latin America. I'm Shane Leary and I'm the program manager of the China Center here at Hudson. As China extends its influence across the globe and the U.S. is increasingly focused on both Europe and the South China Sea, it is immensely important that we continue to focus our attention and diplomatic efforts in other parts of the globe where the People's Republic of China is making significant inroads. Of great importance in this regard is China's ongoing activities in Latin America where it seeks to cement diplomatic ties and trade agreements and establish greater economic leverage. The PRC is watching the world's response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine closely. And as such, they have seen not only how detrimental a coordinated condemnation and international response can be, but so too have they seen how valuable it can be to establish leverage with states before a conflict begins to increase the chances of these states hedging in such an event. If China does indeed move on Taiwan, as they seem intent on doing, it will be to their advantage to have any number of countries who feel apprehensive about condemning their actions or assisting their adversaries in light of having economic dependencies on them. For today's panel, we have an incredible lineup of experts to discuss China's ongoing activities in Latin America. We, of course, have with us Dr. Miles Yu, Senior Fellow and Director of the China Center here at Hudson Institute, who will be addressing China's grand strategy and how Latin America fits into their broader strategic aims. Before coming to Hudson, Dr. Yu served in the Trump administration as the Principal China Policy Advisor to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo where he advised the secretary on all China-related issues and was instrumental in the overhaul of U.S. policy towards China. To give us an overview of the current state of Chinese engagement in Latin America and address the United States' response to this influence, we have several experts with us. Dr. Evan Alice is a professor of Latin America Studies at the U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute. Dr. Ellis has distinguished himself as one of the foremost experts on China's relationship with Latin America and has previously served on the Secretary of State's planning staff with responsibility for Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as international narcotics and law enforcement issues. Dr. Julio Guzman is a Reagan Fiscal Democracy Fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy. He's also a Peruvian politician who founded the centrist political party, Partido Morado, and was a presidential candidate in 2016 and 2021. He has served in government as Secretary General of the Office of the Prime Minister and Vice Minister of Micro and Small Enterprises. Dr. Guzman currently teaches at Princeton University and holds fellowships at both Yale and Stanford universities. With us as well is Pedro Borelli, who is currently the managing partner of BNB Advisors, a firm engaged mostly in commitments in Europe and Latin America, and a co-founder of V5 Initiative, a 501c3 focused on issues of democracy, governance, and transparency in Latin America. He is a graduate of Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and is the chairman of the advisory community committee of Georgetown University's Latin America Leadership Program. Before this, he served on the executive board of Petróleos de Venezuela when it was the largest corporation in Latin America. Born in Venezuela, Mr. Borelli is a frequent commentator on Venezuelan politics and an outspoken critic of the Maduro regime. Last but not least, to moderate this discussion, we have our very own Daniel Batye, who has just joined Hudson Institute as an adjunct fellow working on Latin America and the Caribbean. Mr. Batye previously served in senior roles at both the State Department and the U.S. Agency for International Development during the George W. Bush administration. Prior to this, he worked at Freedom House, where he led programs to strengthen democratic governance and rule of law throughout Latin America. Greatly looking forward to our discussion today, and with that, I'll pass it off to Dan. Thanks, Shane, for the introductions and for that excellent encapsulation of the topic of our panel today. It is a great honor uh, to be here at Hudson and to be a part of this panel today. Today's Wall Street Journal had a front page story titled China Auditions for Lead Global Role. The article describes China's new assertiveness on the world stage and suggests that its original strategy of biding its time while building its strength was overtaken by its need for resources and by by its growing economic and political interests around the world. With regard to Latin America and other developing countries, the article says President Xi wants China to serve as a benign power and a counterweight to a bullying United States. Miles, I would like to get your perspective on this. Is the idea of China as a benign counterweight to the United States a useful way to think about uh, how China sees the world? How does Latin America fit into China's larger strategy? Thank you, Dan, and uh, uh, I'm glad. That, welcome to Hassan, and uh, China Center is honored to to host this event. Um, and um, to answer the question, uh, well, China's Latin American strategy is actually a part of the China's global strategy. And then the question is, what is China's global strategy? Well, China's global strategy is related to China's uh, global paranoia. 
So when I say paranoia, it's not just in the sense of uh, psychological and mental. It's pretty much like ideological. Because according to uh, orthodox Marxist-Leninism, um, uh, socialist country like China uh, is uh, naturally, inevitably, the arch enemy uh, of the international capitalism. And only socialist country uh, in the world that has the capability uh, to triumph is China. So China has this kind of you know uh, self awareness that it is only a correct uh, uh, socialist country that is uh, besieged by international hostile forces led by the United States. Therefore, uh, they believe that China is in the middle of the uh, being contained and uh, the target of a peaceful evolution or color revolution and also regime change. So this is what China's strategic paranoia is all about. As such, to maintain regime stability and survival, therefore, is the primal motive of many of China's international stance. This is a very important part of China's global strategy. To do that, you would have to do pretty much like two things. One is you have to create a global economic and technological dependency on China. That's China's primary mode of operandi these days. Two is to uh, uh, to uh, figure out a, a series of glo uh, global counter-strike at the West in general and the United States in particular. We have seen this uh, in the last couple of days when uh, Xi Jinping visited uh, Moscow and came out with a pretty strong statement to pretty much like illustrate that kind of strategy. So let me just talk about uh, 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 the agenda number one, to create a global economic and technological dependency on China. That's where Latin America played a very crucial role because Latin America is one of the primary area uh, for China's strategy in, in, this, in this regard. That is, uh, Latin America provides very rich resource extraction. China's uh, 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 engagement in this aspect is, is pretty robust, I'm sure. Uh, all the panelists uh, in, um, in this section will uh, uh, provide more um, uh, insights on this. Secondly, China's uh, approach to uh, Latin America in this regard would be uh, a massive capital investment. The purpose of that is basically to, re to replace the role of the West dominated uh, uh, financial institutions such as the World Bank and Inter um, Inter-American Development Bank and even IMF. So that's why China wants to play a very dominant role. Thirdly, I think China wants to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to develop a a, uh, to basically enhance infrastructure development to uh, create the regional links among all the countries with China being uh, the major uh, um, sort of pusher for this. So this is basically uh, the, uh, the, the, the economic and technological dependency part. Second part, China's Latin, uh, Latin America in China's global strategy is, is a very important part of the global counter-strike uh, at the West and at the United States. I'm going to basically uh, just briefly mention some of the things. Uh, China basically want to use Latin America to mitigate and diminish America's influence in the region. Uh, I mentioned about the uh, uh, capital investment uh, to replace uh, the, the international institutions. That's one of them. Another thing is uh, uh, to develop the China-controlled regional alliance and integration plans. Uh, China, for example, has been... Uh, uh, instrumental in creating this uh, the community of Latin American and the Caribbean uh, states, CELAC, and and uh, subsequently the China CELAC Forum. So those were designed to create China's regional influence. Um, and then the next thing would be uh, Latin America play a very important role in China's uh, uh, political and propaganda warfare uh, um, as part of the global strategy. Uh, so, uh, for example, China support, China has been supportive of all the anti-U.S. rogue countries, especially Cuba, Venezuela, and, uh, uh, and it, Latin America became a major venue for China to hyperventilate anti-American sentiment. If you recall, during the height of the uh, 2001 crisis of the EP3 incident, when the United States president tried to communicate with the uh, Chinese pre uh, Secretary General Jiang Zemin, he refused to pick up the phone. Instead, where did he go? He flew to Cuba. 
and uh, where he uh, recited Chairman Mao's quotations and uh, vented his anti-American sentiment over there. And uh, uh, the, the uh, Chavez uh, Maduro regime in Venezuela also has become a primary uh, uh, a venue for China to hyperventilate its propaganda against the United States. Also, you should recall Xi Jinping's most uh, 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 explicit anti-American remarks were made when he was visiting Mexico. So uh, this was a very uh, uh, important part of the uh, uh, um, Chinese uh, 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 global propaganda and uh, political affair um, agenda. And when the Chinese uh, Navy wants to enhance its uh, soft power, it sends its uh, cap uh, hospital ships to the Caribbean first. Um, and also it's tried to sort of uh, bring Brazil into this uh, China dominated the regional alliance of BRICS. Um, uh, and so Brazil plays a very important role in this Chinese strategic uh, uh, maneuver such as this. And I will also um, say um, Latin America also is playing an increasingly important role in um, um, Chinese uh, global agenda in the arena of uh, military security intelligence and law enforcement because China is developing very robust um, uh, anti-US agenda in those area. Let's talk about the military. Uh, military engagement in Latin America, China primarily dealing with countries like in Venezuela. Uh, China has exported the uh, fighter jets and missiles to Venezuela, to Chavez and uh, Maduro regime. And China also has had a um, pretty robust military training and a joint exercise uh, 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 programs with the, the Venezuelan military. Um, China also has tried, has increased its uh, weapon sales to uh, a number of uh, very important Latin American countries like Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Peru. So uh, you can see there is uh, that er area. Now on security and intelligence, uh, China also uh, uh, increases efforts to control choke points such as the Panama Canal. And, uh, um, and uh, I'm sure the panelists would, would have more insight on that. China also is trying to uh, plan, uh, develop a plan B in case Panama Canal could not be controlled. So they are very um, intent, uh, sort of intense uh, in, terms, in terms of working on countries like Nicaragua and Guatemala, where an alternative isthmus canal could possibly be dug out. So that is uh, there. And China also conduct uh, intense security intelligence operations in countries that recognize Taiwan uh, in Central American countries. And they uh, have done a number of uh, pretty successful operations there. Uh, overall though, um, and uh, Chinese intelligence operations in Latin America focuses on gathering economic and trade secrets related to US technological and regional trade um, uh, issues in this area. Now on law enforcement, which actually is very important because uh, law enforcement issue uh, has been in, in some, some sense, the focal point of the US relationship with Latin American countries, particularly with Mexico and some Central American countries. Uh, this uh, has basically several elements of that. One is China has been uh, pretty active in um, offshore money laundering using the Latin American uh, country, particularly some of the Caribbean countries as a, uh, a safe haven for its illicit assets. Some of them actually state-run operations uh, to evade international monetary uh, uh, regulation and monitoring. Uh, and now, obviously, on everybody's mind in the United States is China's involvement in uh, uh, America's drug infestation. Uh, and particularly uh, the fentanyl uh, export from Mexico to the United States, China play a very important role in supplying uh, critical components of the fentanyl manufacturing in Mexico. And uh, also uh, uh, some might say, you know, there's a lot of reports about China's role in providing drug cartel financing. And that's one aspect of the uh, law enforcement uh, uh, issues that we, uh, we uh, it's called sort of, sort of part of the Chinese global strategy. Uh, recently, though, because our southern border has been pretty porous, so there have been um, a large number of uh, illegal border crossing by Chinese uh, nationals, nationals. 
and some of the American intelligence um, uh, community believes are highly suspicious of being Chinese state uh, sponsored by the Chinese states for um, a number of uh, malign purposes. So overall, Latin America and China's global strategy is uh, to create economic and financial techno technological dominance through massive capital investment, infrastructure building, regional integration, and a political coalition. Secondly, is to use Latin America as a platform to uproot the US as the leading rival of the CCP regime and part of the CCP's global strategy for regime survival and socialist triumph. So uh, that's pretty like a broad picture. And uh, I am going to stop here and looking forward to hear more of the uh, expert uh, insights. Thank you. Thank you, Miles. You covered a lot of ground there. I appreciate that. I want to turn to Evan. Um, Evan, you have described how the scope of China's engagement has become broader over time and how China has become skillful uh, working across many different dimensions and with different actors. Could you give us a brief overview of where China's engagement stands today and how this is translating into greater influence in, in the region? Absolutely. And uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity. And, and thanks to Hudson for the opportunity to be part of this. And, and of course, uh, my recognition just at the level of expertise I hear with my, my uh, colleagues and friends, uh, Miles and Pedro and, and, and Julio. So uh, first rate panel. Um, so uh, to take about 10 minutes to, to briefly uh, go over some of the, some of the big uh, um, uh, details. Uh, so first of all, um, I, I do see the primary thrust of Chinese activities, as Miles alluded to, as commercial in nature. However, the effect in the nature is strategic, even though it's it's primarily economic. Um, I do see it getting more political, more assertive, um, and particularly we've seen with the uh, the uh, flip that's in progress on 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 uh, in Honduras on, on Taiwan um, and some others, um, an increasing focus on that very political strategic uh, dimension. Um, but to start out with commercial, and I'll talk a little bit about political and, and military. Military. Um, but certainly in, in commercial, it, it's something that's very much felt in, in the region. Uh, now China is uh, the number one uh, trade partner of just about every country in the region, uh, south of Costa Rica, about uh, um, $330 billion in, in 2021, depending on whose numbers that you believe in. But uh, also in the past 20 years, about $173 billion um, in non-financial uh, foreign direct in, in investment. Um, and that goes across a variety of areas. Um, but for me, it's important to put together both the trade and in the investment to note that there's really kind of three areas of focus. Um, there's acquisition securely of the commodities and foodstuffs that the Chinese uh, need to make their economy function. Um, and it's also access to markets. Um, but the important thing is understanding that the way that the Chinese often use their, their state owned enterprises and the role of the state and the security services to do so is really also aimed at capturing value added as they pursue um, both horizontal and vertical uh, integration uh, across Latin America markets, among others. And that really raises important questions about who benefits is the Chinese uh, role advances. Um, it's also um, increasingly shifting from um, just buying Latin America's goods or, or, or exporting things to what I would call presence. So the first wave in which Chinese companies really started coming in in mass uh, through mergers and acquisitions and, and, and through incremental advances uh, was in 2010, which was, again, when there were a lot of good bargains and, and a lot of advance in, in Chinese knowledge. But it was right after the 2008 financial crisis. Um, the second wave I see coming now is with similar timing and for similar reasons. Um, now as we push out of the COVID period, because Specifically, uh, not only uh, in China do you have uh, President Xi giving more policy certainty, uh, now thoroughly uh, enmeshed in his uh, unprecedented third term in office, but you also have China's zero COVID, which makes it a lot easier for uh, Chinese um, uh, SOEs and other companies to actually go to Latin America to do the deals. And at the same time, you have Latin America itself pushing through some of the COVID restrictions and, and difficulties, which really facilitates moving forth with some infrastructure projects with which they want to talk with the Chinese. Um, but it's also important to mention that it's multi sector and the areas where the Chinese are making a push are uh, changing. And we see this in, in the most recent China SELAC plan, as, as Miles alluded to, the 2022-2024 plan, for, for example. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on energy, especially um, energy transmission with high voltage, uh, long distance transmission. There's a lot of emphasis on um, green energy. And so, uh, so uh, um, uh, 
different hydroelectric facilities, uh, wind, um, and there's a, a lot of which I use as technology scaled up based on things that were stolen uh, fr from the Europeans to, to be specific. Um, but in addition to that, you see a big push in, in digital technologies. It's not just about 5G. The Chinese have been, uh, for example, Huawei has been in the region since the late 1990s, uh, but it's also about things like, like cloud computing. It's about things like, like safe cities and smart cities technologies. It's about e-commerce. Um, and also the Chinese, especially since the um, the, uh, the the pandemic um, have recognized that the need to get into mRNA vaccine technology. And so in select countries where they did phase three trials that they've begun to uh, push for more uh, presence in, in laboratories and in, in partnerships in, in the biotech sector. Now, beyond that important to note that um, there's also a, a big focus on what I would call multidimensional connectivity. Now we've heard a lot about the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, we're gonna hear a lot more about it this year. First of all, because uh, Lula during his trip over to China um, is, um, you know, very likely going to uh, uh, announce uh, Brazil ad adherence to the, the Belt and Road. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's going to be the third uh, Belt and Road Forum in, in China this year, which is again going to spotlight uh, that continuing advance, even though uh, China has also put a lot of weight in recent years on what they call the Global Development Initiative, which is kind of trying to get China back to its south-south roots, which is a little bit um, more kind of warm and fuzzy of we're just here to help. Now, in addition to that, important to note that um, China is making important advances, even with well-institutionalized countries like, like Chile or, or Colombia, um, especially uh, with its increasing sophisticated um, you know, companies like, like China Harbor, um, uh, although sometimes their technology and techniques are you know, leave something to be desired, but they're increasingly getting good at using public-private partnerships and, and other arrangements to, to win the contracts and at least implement them. Um, you see also um, in what they call hydrovias, and so basically the dredging and maintaining of, of river routes in some strategic places like the Paraguay and, and Paraná River corridors, um, which is critical for uh, South America's uh, agricultural economy exports. Um, you also see uh, increasingly um, uh, a presence in, in the port sector. So it's not just Hutchison and Wampoa, which has a well-established presence in, in Panama, as, as well as in Freeport, the Bahamas, uh, in, in various other places. But it's also um, other uh, companies, for example, the consortium that right now is, is building what the, the port in, in Chiang Kai in Peru, which will be a, a 15 berth deep water, $3.1 billion port, which will probably um, you know transform the dynamics of, of shipping and, and logistics uh, in, in the Pacific. And so you have those advantages. Um, but you also have advances in terms of, as I pointed out, um, electricity connectivity, digital connectivity. So what increasingly is, is happening is, is the Chinese are uh, occupying strategic positions in those technologies that not only get them the money, but also are, um, you know, uh, critical to leverage in the other things that they want in, in winning the value added in, in Latin America. Um, now, I mentioned that uh, there is a political dimension um, that's both bilateral and multilateral. Um, so in the multilateral spaces, as uh, Miles mentioned very well, um, you have the Chinese um, getting very involved through the the, the China SELAC forum. Um, and it was really interesting, if, if you look at the most recent, it wasn't even a China SELAC forum, it was just the SELAC meeting. Um, the United States, which is technically not part of SELAC, was invited out of SELAC's generosity as, as an observer. And so uh, Chris Dodd was there and kind of silently sat to, to be a, play a low pro profile role. Um, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping was actually um, you know, invited to give the keynote speech. And so in some ways, it kind of highlights the difference between how Latin America is looking at the United States versus how it's looking at, at China right now. Um, but beyond that, it's things like the Inter-American Development Bank, where, where China has used its uh, now uh, you know, 14 year old role uh, to position its companies to, to win contracts, as well as some of the subnational forums in, in the Caribbean and in other places. But there's also, as, as Miles alluded to, an increasing aggressive bilateral presence. And so, for example, we, we've just seen this the, the new uh, the flip on on Taiwan. Uh, President uh, Xiomara Castro is foreign minister, as, as well as uh, her her daughter and, and her daughter's husband. Very personalistic negotiations are are over in in China this week and negotiating that that flip. Um, but we've seen Nicaragua's flip. We've seen, of course, you have the, the diplomacy with, with Lula going over there. We understand that uh, in in Suriname, yes, Suriname is in South America. Chan Santo is probably going to be traveling to China later this year. Petro has said he's going to be traveling. Gabriel Boric in Chile is going to be traveling over there. Um, and it appears also that Xi Jinping it, later this year will come. So again, we see a very aggressive um, yeah, post-COVID uh, response there. Um, and beyond that, of course, there is a military dimension. It's it's not the most critical thing. China tries to keep it as low profile, but as, as Miles alluded to, um, what you find is, is there are some weapon sales, especially with the populist countries, uh, uh, Venezuela buying uh, K fighters and, and JYL-1 radars. 
um, Ecuador under Rafael Correa buying, for example, uh, over 700 military trucks. Um, but it's also not just the populist countries. And so, for example, Peru a couple of years ago under a conservative government, um, you know, buying uh, multiple launch rocket systems. Uh, actually, Peru right now in the middle of its political crisis, um, taking delivery on Chinese armored vehicles and in various other uh, other trucks. I just got back from Panama this week. Um, China there has one of the, the the most sophisticated ambassadors that it sent to the region, uh, uh, Wei Qiang. Um, and it's interesting that just a couple of days ago, um, uh, or actually just a couple of weeks ago, uh, delivered uh, uh, 6,000 uh, Kevlar vests and, and, and other gear badly needed by Sanan and Senafront and others. So there's a lot of kind of gift giving. They gave, uh, you know, you see this with police forces in the Dominican Republic, in Trinidad and Tobago, in, in Jamaica and various other places to keep doors open and, and, and gain goodwill and influence. Um, but in addition to that, you do have a lot of people to people diplomacy, uh, including not only uh, military to military trips and, and others to Beijing, to places like the um, National Defense University in, in Champaign, but also reciprocally uh, China coming over to, to the region in places like uh, the Elite Special Operations course, the Lanceros course that Columbia runs in Tolomida, um, the Jungle Warfare School that the Brazilians have, um, and also the, the Chinese coming over um, in, in a variety of different kind of low profile but, but important uh, military visits. And so uh, the sending of, of frigates to do exercises, uh, the sending, as Miles mentioned, uh, three separate major multi-stop visits by their hospital ship, the Peace Arc, which is kind of like uh, you know USS Comfort, but they do acupuncture. But it, it's a very important soft power instrument and, and presence instrument. Um, and frankly, uh, various other things that are below the radar. But these raise some issues of concern because if we ever go to war with China over, over Taiwan and the Chinese need to look for options to operate in, in the region, those relationships as well as their commercial presence will be very important um, in what they can do in the region in addition to, to their diplomacy. And finally, um, what, what I think the two things that I, I want to really emphasize here is the region moves into a, a, a crisis in terms of, of political mobilization, governance, and, and, and things like that. Um, number one, that even the center and right wing governments, not just the left, are, are vulnerable to working with China. Um, you know, we see that the level of business that Ecuador under Guillermo Lasso does with China, um, even as he's politically on the ropes, we see at the prospect that, that Paraguay will flip after the elections in in um, th this May, we see Uruguay, which even with a center-right regime, well-institutionalized, uh, the Le Kaije Po government does a lot of business with, with China and, and a lot of security cooperation. Um, and finally, one of the things that we've taken for granted, and I remember when, when Miles and I were working for Secretary Pompeo, uh, you know, um, it seems like the, the good old days not that long ago when U.S. power was in a different place. Um, but uh, it was interesting to see the, the way in which, for example, our strategic relationship with, with Mexico is, is a bulwark against China's advance um, under Peña Neto and, and previously under under Calderon. Um, the role of Central America and our partners in Central America, like, like El Salvador and, and the conservative regime in Guatemala, um, that's all changing now. Um, you know, again, with Shumar Castro's flap, with, with Bukele basically giving us the, the, the thumb, with, uh, with, with, with AMLO increasingly not only welcoming the, welcoming the Chinese in in different projects, but really taking a foreign policy under a broad that, that is not as cooperative as it once does. And so the strategic landscape is, is changing in which, so it's not just about the economic advance, but it's about the type of open doors and risks that this just evolving panorama across multiple dimensions creates. So it's it's a, it's a worrisome prospect, although it's one in which uh, the United States still does have a horse in the fight. Thank you, Evan. That's a sobering picture. Uh, Julio, you wrote in an article in Foreign Affairs, which I commend to everyone, that it is important for the U United States to understand where we can and where we can't compete effectively with China. Can you tell us more about how you look at the comparative advantage of the United States and other uh, democracies relative to China? Of course. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Dan, and thank you so much for uh, Hudson Institution for inviting me uh, for organizing this event so, with such a wonderful panel. Uh, I think before um, explaining why I believe uh, the Western world should invest in human capital. I think uh, 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 previous ideas are important to mention. The first one is that uh, before thinking about any plan, even including the ideas that I am proposing, uh, we need to have three things. And the first one is recognize that uh, we don't have a plan right now. And uh, mostly what we have are discussions, exchange of very good ideas, but we don't have a plan. And that's a bigger problem in comparison to having a mediocre plan. The second one is that if we're gonna work on a plan, we need to do it in a very honest and professional way. And what I'm saying is, is, is the following is, I, I don't think 
that if the United States just uh, by pressure or because they want to enlighten the auditorium, start doing initiatives without thinking deeply about what, what are they doing and what are going to be the consequences in the long term. So that's what I mean. If we are going to work on Latin America, we need to do it right. We need to do it well. And I think this is an historic point of time in which there is the time in which we're going to make decisions. If they, our decisions right now go to the, our base on different criteria or conditions, we're going to see the consequences very soon. And the third one is a change in attitude. We cannot think about uh, writing a plan if, if, uh, if we don't recognize that the Western world should change their attitude with Latin America. And it means, first of all, revalorizing, revalorizing and uh, uh, rethinking what is the importance of Latin America, not only for the Western world, but for the global uh, area in general. And I think that discussion has started, but has not finished yet. We need to know exactly why Latin America is important for the Western world and the world in general. Also, a change in attitude means to recognize that Latin America has been taken for granted for 30 years. And, um, and the Western world uh, cannot expect that the results of changing structurally the region is going to uh, come in soon. That is not going to happen. And finally, Change in attitude also means that we need to understand that the politics in Latin America right now is not the same as the politics in the 80s or the 90s. And unfortunately, not all, but I found people here in Washington that have this approach of thinking that Latin America has been frozen all these years. And we need to see Latin America in a different way based on what happened in the last three decades. The next point, Main, uh, I think it's to define the criteria of the intervention. Now let's imagine that we have decided to do something really professional and thinking right after about this. So I think there are some criteria that we need to have in mind before writing something. Uh, the first one is that any intervention should be strategic. We need to think about medium and long term uh, uh, horizons and to know exactly what kind of goals we are pursuing. That means strategic. The second one is that we need to keep in mind that this should be at scale. We cannot pretend just intervening in the countries that are like-minded to the United States or they are not. No, we need to think this big. We need to think about having an impact in the whole region. Of course, going from a small to something bigger, but having always in mind that this should be an intervention that the results are, we're gonna see it at scale. The third criteria is that any plan should be coordinated. And this is very difficult. I was the president of the vice minister cabinet in Peru. And one of the, of the most difficult things is to coordinate to everyone, with everyone. I know this is, is difficult. But at least it should be a, a minimum common denominator, denominator in coordination effectiveness. I, uh, in terms of many US agencies that should be involved in this. Another criteria is sustainability. The interventions that we're gonna uh, think about, it needs to be interventions that contain tools, resources, and incentives that are realistic. And what I mean realistic is that we at least has, have an idea that it's going to work in Latin America, that everything has changed. Uh, proposing things that Latin America doesn't want is not going to leave us anywhere. And I am saying this again because some of the reactions that I have here in Washington is to follow the same approach. We're going to give the region the things that the Western world want according to their priorities. And I don't think that's the way. I think we need to listen a little bit more about what Latin America wants. And also another criteria is to focus on the elite establishment and civil society. Indeed, in general, stakeholders, not governments. We don't need to, to focus on governments because governments change all the time from the left to the right. They don't have ideology. They don't have political platforms. They don't have organizations. What we need to invest are the stakeholders that are gonna be there always. 
forever. And the, and the, and the decisions that they make, the elite, the establishment, and the and civil society. And finally, the last criteria before grading any plan is to uh, be sure or be aware that this is going to take time. This is going to take time. This is not going to take two years, three years. China has uh, intervening in Latin America very quickly. In 15 years, it you know, uh, uh, China did most of the things that my colleagues has uh, already explained. Uh, but we cannot pretend that in two, three, or four years, this is going to change completely. Uh, we need to, to set our goals. And, I mean, every five year set goals in, in which we need to follow what we are uh, thinking to achieve. And we need to be patient about this. So if we have clarity on that, then I'm going to share with you a couple of ideas uh, among the many that are in order to intervene in Latin America. And the starting point, at least for me, is to recognize that the battle for Latin America is not about economic hegemony. It's about values and hemispheric security. That's the point, I believe. So if we need to change values, if, or if we need to promote or remind Latin American uh, countries what values we share. If we are talking about hemispheric security, it's important to understand that we need to invest in people because people are the ones who make ideas, principles, values uh, alive. And they will make the future political decisions based on that. I believe that one of the mistakes that we could make, including in the plan, is to play the same game China is playing that competing for putting more money in the region, I think is a mistake. And it's a mistake for many reasons. First, we don't have the, the resources. We don't have the institutions, the kind, of isti the kind of institutions, authoritarian, to make those kinds of decisions. But most importantly, because of an, a structural uh, uh, problem, which is that, uh, unfortunately, economic progress do not, uh, is not before democracy. So political liberalization doesn't follow economic liberalization. And we have many examples in the 20th century uh, for that. So uh, the main objectives in our, in our plan, I believe should be three. Uh, the first one is to increase awareness, general awareness. Most people in Latin America, they don't know what's going on with China. <laughs> they really don't know all these risks and all the practices and the corruption cases, they really don't know. The only thing they see are the smartphones, are the bridge, are the stadium built by the Chinese, but that's it. We need to increase awareness, not only in the elite and the educated population, but also, uh, as I said, in, in all the stakeholders. The second goal, it's to, um, it's to, a school is to influence future political decisions. How we're going to be able to future, to, to, to have influence in the decisions of people that are going to be in power in the, in the next 15, 20 years. And one way of doing that is to school the new generation of young leaders in Latin America. We need to do that. And we need to do that, not the elite in which most programs in with the Western world uh, uh, allocate their resources, but particularly in the base of the social pyramid, in which the fight for democracy is the more intense. The, the most important battle for democracy is not being taken at the top. It's at the bottom, in the localities, in the communities, in the mining projects there. I think we need to invest, we need to school the young leaders across Latin America with different tools and incentives. Uh, and finally, uh, investing also in people is investing in our personal relations between Americans and Latin Americans. For instance, diplomacy. We need to re-engage. We need to get in love again. We were in love. Well, we need to get again in love by proposing a new relationship, a new kind of relationship. What is this kind of relationship? I'm going to listen to you. 
I'm going to listen. What do you want and why? I'm going to respect you. I'm going to treat you not like my little brother. I'm going to treat you like, like an equal. And then we're going to build something together. And we're going to be something together. We're, we're, we're going to create something together that is going to be beneficial for you and for me. And we're going to share the uh, profits of that development. I think that diplomacy, it's important. The presence is important. Even the physical presence is important. I cannot understand that now there are 12 Latin American countries without U.S. ambassadors. That's just one, uh, uh, one example. Uh, so this is one of the things. The other thing in human capital, it's we need to expose more Latin American citizens to the Western world and with their own values. Um, I am talking here to exposing Latin American citizens with the most important strength that the Western world has, which is the higher education system. How many Latin Americans, students or faculty or researchers are in the US? How many? You know, they are... Pretty, it's a, a very small number. You need to look for them if you want to meet one. We are underrepresented in the higher education system. And how can we pretend to engage with the new leaders in civil society, private sector, uh, uh, politics, if, if we do not share experiences and we not nurture ourselves with uh, education, which is so powerful? My case is one, the father of my grandfather was a peasant, was a peasant, hundred full time in the mountains. And now I'm here talking to you. Why? Because of education and because of the education that I receive in part here in the States based on Western values. So this is one thing, human capital and relationships. And we can go to the details in another time to discuss some ideas. But the second uh, uh, part, I believe, it's to make things uh, more difficult to China in terms of this relationship. And one way of doing it is to promote a thicker fabric of economic relations between both uh, areas. But economic relations not based on governments, economic relations not based on loans or, fu or funding st stadiums or public infrastructure projects, no. What I mean is the fabric, the, the civil society fabric in terms of trade, commerce, uh, uh, businesses in general. And I think that one of the things that you don't want to do when you have a problem is to fight with your partner. <laughs> That's, you know, nobody does that. If we engage more in that sense, it's gonna be more difficult for Latin America to get the United States and the Western world aside. How can we do that? I'm gonna give four ideas. The first one is to take advantage of the already existed free trade agreements. Now, the world trade, trade is very difficult in Capitol Hill, okay? But we don't need that. We don't need that additional political capital because the free trade agreements already exist. And the United States has 11 free trade uh, agreements that according to the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, we have take, taken ad advantage of those agreements at least at only 10%. How can we do that? We need to talk about non-tariff barriers. We need to talk about transparency in trade. We need to talk about equality and mutual respect when we're doing trade because most Latin American countries, we are not treated that, that way. We need to talk about certainty in the rules to make businesses that we don't have. Another area, another second area, it's trade facilitation, bilateral. Everything that I'm talking here is bilateral, please. Because if we do this for everybody, we are, we are playing for the other ones too. So bilateral trade facilitation, which is customs, which is uh, uh, basic services in the export import uh, uh, agencies between the two blocks. And that is gonna push trade very significantly. When I was at the Inter-American Development Bank, I was part of the team that made this uh, important research. And we calculated you know, uh, how much of the, of the trade value is explained by tariffs. And it was less than 5%. So most of the 
of, of the value in additional trade uh, is explained by changes in transport costs and trade facilitation. That's the trade agenda is not in tariffs, it's in other issues. Then another area, I'm not gonna finish with that, uh, Another area is to uh, to take or to to leverage in the stakeholders that are being affected by China. There are several stakeholders that are important. They have voice, but they don't have power, and they have been affected uh, 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 negatively by by China. I'm talking about local communities that are affected by the mining pro uh, mining projects and uh, natural resources projects that the Chinese used not to respect international or local uh, laws. I'm talking about the small and medium enterprises that are competing with Chinese products that nobody knows how they produce this. Some of them are very well sub uh, uh, subsidized. And also I'm talking about workers, workers, because the Chinese companies are not, they do not excel in respecting labor standards. So there are stakeholders that they are, they are organized they have voice, but they don't have power. And how can we engage with them? We can engage with them, for instance, working together in trade uh, inclusive businesses. Uh, what it means? It means try to organize them in terms of economic and, and, and commerce uh, uh, way, giving technical assistance, giving uh, tools for innovation, uh, mm -hmm. incorporating them into value change, those kinds of things, and we can take those stakeholders that are not happy with China to our side mm -hmm. and work with us. So this is some some uh, some ideas, but I believe the most important thing now is to recognize the first two points that I mentioned, which is the the criteria where we're going to do, do that and the basic concepts that we need to manage in order to write a plan. Thank you, Julio. Um, I want to go to Pedro. Um, Pedro, you have thought deeply about uh, Chinese activities in Latin America in the context of great power competition. And you've pointed out that China's activities in Latin America don't happen in a vacuum. Uh, sometimes they are a response to uh, the actions of the United States or others. Uh, what are the factors that we need to bear in mind as we think about how China uh, thinks about its activities in Latin America? Thanks, thanks for the invitation to this panel. Um, I think it's important to like separate the problem in like three pieces here. One is China and its objectives. Second, Latin America and its reality. And third, the US and how the US deals with this. Um, the first thing is that we have to look at China and be very sure that we understand what activities that China is involved in in Latin America are completely and totally legitimate, okay? Legitimate from an expanding power that needs access to resources, markets for its products, and places where to invest its reserves. So it's impossible to imagine that what we're gonna to do to contain China is going to eliminate the fact that China in the last 20 years has become a very powerful socialist, capitalist authoritarian society that has become the factory of the world by virtue of the world's desire to source cheaply from China. So the economies of scale that China has received is because everybody was willing to outsource to China uh, cheap production, gave them huge economies of scale, and that has basically created a potent player, both in the need to buy natural materials and in the ability to sell what they produce. So when we look at China, we have to be very careful that we don't go in in a sense of paranoia, attacking literally behavior that the Europeans and the Americans have actually exercised as they themselves grew and sought markets and sought natural resources. So it becomes very difficult to go to Latin America and talk about China as a bad guy, if what you're saying or what you're not singling out is those things that were usually the purview of either Euro European countries or of the United States. So it makes a lot of sense to separate. The second thing we talk about in Latin America now 
is Latin America does not exist as a notion except as a geography. Okay, Latin America seen as the northern part, which is Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, and South America, is just a geographical definition. There is no political unity. There's no sense of purpose. There's no economic unity. So it's just a bunch of different countries, some that are extremely different than others. And now, in this particular moment, we're probably going through one of the worst moments, both in economic performance, in political governability, in respect for, for institutions, in the whole notion of, I mean, we have a definitely a democratic decay. The expectations of democracy have not been fulfilled. The respect for democratic institutions are not there in many countries. So Latin America is in a pretty way, but, but the opportunities are there. I mean, the, the, the raw materials are there, the consumers are there, and therefore it is gonna be always interesting. The third thing about the United States is that clearly the United States as the way they perceive themselves in the world have the, you know, multiple crises at the same time. And it is, I mean, somebody used to say about Latin America, uh, a very famous senator, Senator Luger, said, no nukes, no terrorists, no problems. It was kind of nice not to be seen as a problem, okay? But the problem is that if you're focused on those things that are short-term, huge risk for US national security, and you forget or neglect Latin America, those things that were perceived to be small risk or those players that are nefarious who are in the region can actually become your biggest problems. And the thing is that if Latin America turns from being the land of opportunity or the land of eternal potential to an area of real risk and real physical risk for the United States, then I think it's game over. It's a complete new paradigm because the United States has been very comfortable looking at its neighbors in the region as allies, as friends, as benign enemies, but not as mortal enemies. So as we put all this together, then what do we see? We see a China that is playing its role with money, opportunity, desire, and with willing takers. There's willing partners, there's willing sellers, there's willing buyers, okay? So this is not being forced on anybody. We can talk about nefarious practices. We can talk about conditionality, lack thereof or no conditionality, how it works. But the fact is that there's this trade that has gone. I mean, if we look at the last 20 years, the multiples, I mean, if we look at, you know, probably bilateral trade 20 years ago was $12 billion. Right now is $320 billion. Uh, investment was, you know, Peanuts, you know, $12 billion probably 20 years ago. It's now probably $200 billion if you look at loans. So everything is expanded. And, and we cannot say, you know, go back and say, no, this is not happening. No, this is happening and will happen much more. Now, if the United States wants to deal with this issue because it sees the risk, then it has to be laser precise as to what are the activities that it should be warning it's still allies and it's friends in the region to be watchful about and mindful about. The problem is that this is a fast changing battlefield. As great power competition intensifies, and we have this breakdown from the unipolar world to a multipolar world in which each pole wants to have its sphere of influence, the United States doesn't recognize that notion of the world. Okay. It's not willing to grant, and it wasn't willing to grant Russia its sphere of influence, and it's definitely not willing to grant China its sphere of influence. So both Russia and China believe that they have to come and play in what used to be the United States' sphere of influence, and where the Monroe Doctrine ruled and defined more than anything what a sphere of influence was. So in this game now, as the conflicts between the great powers intensifies, Playing hardball in Latin America becomes fair game. So as we look at the incentive, this wasn't part of the original plan. This is an acceleration of a plan. This is a weaponization of a plan. This is a hyper-politicization of a plan in which playing hardball in Latin America is part of what you're doing in response to the U.S.'s uh, moves in the Indo-Pacific and what you're doing, obviously, particularly now, where Vladimir Putin is being defeated not by Ukraine, by but by a United States who's been able to, 
you know, put together a massive coalition, bring NATO back together now. So what we're going to see here is a, a super charge period of competition in which if you are going to be successful, you cannot create paranoia. You cannot attack everything that China does in the region as bad, because I think people will not understand it. Consumers will understand it. You know, people who are getting benefits from investments won't understand it. You have to be very laser perp, you know, the purpose of your of your strategy has to be laid. And it is try to focus on those things that the Chinese are dying to undermine in the region, which is the rule of law, democracy, respect for human rights. That's what they want undermined. And I think where you have to focus your attention is what have those Western values done in the past for prosperity? To the extent that you feel that democracy hasn't delivered, you don't care. That's that's a risk. Some people might say, who cares about this? We want authoritarian leaders. We want people who resolve problems. And who, we, we don't care what they do. So you have to be very careful how, how you push that key. But the fundamental thing is that the weaknesses of, of China is that on all those counts, they obviously have problems, internal problems, okay? They're running away from that. China is a time bomb, internal time bomb, because the only way their experiment could work is through repression, okay? So that authoritarian state is necessary for their model of development. So if you undermine that and people begin to understand that, things change. But what's happening in the region is actually the opposite. We're getting more authoritarian, more populist, people are more willing. The surveillance society is very attractive. It's being imposed on them very cheaply. People are beginning to use it to spy on their enemies, to spy on the population as a whole. So this is where you have to focus, very tactical. If you go an all-out approach against China, you're going to lose. You don't have, as, as Julio was saying, you don't have the money to compete. Okay, You don't have the speed of decision-making to compete. So you have to go in. And in order to do that, you cannot do it just as the U.S. You got to bring Canada on board. You got to bring the Europeans on board. You got to bring Korea on board. You got to bring Japan on board. Okay, this is U.S. and its allies. The U.S. basically is starting from too many steps behind in order to have any credibility. People have to understand that the alternative to China is this whole array of countries that have common interests that together are truly powerful, that together are bigger than China. But if the United States pretends to do it on its own, it won't work. And the reason it doesn't work, just to end, to focus on the U.S. policymaking thing, is that the U.S. policy apparatus is broken down. The policymaking process in the U.S. is crisis and reactive base, and it's NSC, White House-centric. And the fact is that that system cannot take more than three or four crises at a time. So if you're permanently, permanently, the fifth or sixth or seventh crisis, you're going to be neglected by design. The second problem that the U.S. policymaking uh, system has is that it's silo-based. The guy who knows about China doesn't know squat about Russia, doesn't know about organized crime. That guy doesn't know about energy. That guy doesn't know about Latin America. And what we're dealing in Latin America is a cross-silo crisis where all factors, transnational crime is taking over, you have issues of governance, you have energy issues, you've got economic growth issues, you've got the involvement of China, the involvement of Russia. And unless you create teams that are cross-silo teams, you're not going to be able to deal with what is a massive, multi-sectoral, multi-player crisis that is facing Latin America and the U.S.'s relationship with Latin America. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, Evan, I was intrigued by an article you wrote about how if the United States is to successfully uh, limit China's dominance in Latin America, the U.S. needs to fundamentally change its approach in several areas, as our other panelists have, have alluded to. Uh, for example, you suggested that we need to rethink the role of the U.S. government as an economic actor and how the U.S. government works with uh, U.S. businesses overseas. Could you tell us more about that? 
Sure, absolutely. Um, and really to, to open, I, I think uh, there are a, a number of kernels of, of, of excellent ideas with which uh, I, I find myself uh, strongly in uh, agreement with what uh, Pedro just said, with what Julio said, um, and, and also uh, recognizing, and I remember again, when, when Miles and I worked some of these issues with Secretary of Pompeo, um, you know, these are really hard problems. It's obviously, well, why don't we just do things differently? Um, but I think there are a couple uh, principles. First, really, uh, dovetailing off of what Pedro said, um, we have to start out with with the, the idea of not trying to tell our Latin American neighbors that, that they can't do legitimate business interactions with, with China. That's uh, really unworkable, and it's frankly counterproductive in terms of, of U.S. influence in, in the relationship. Um, I think where the sweet spot is, is really, it's a multi-sectoral approach. It's, it's number one, uh, trying to um, channel the way that China engages in, in a way that that's, that's healthier for the region and, and healthier for us. Um, number one, that has to do with insisting on transparency. And you can do that with uh, with uh, State Department visa policy, with our public diplomacy. You can do that with OFAC sanctions. You can do that with a variety of different um, you know, types of uh, inducements. Um, but really, uh, tr really trying to, to sell Latin America on, on the idea that um, if the big deals are being made between your longstanding corrupt politicians um, and their Chinese counterparts in the upstairs room of, of some restaurant, um, it's probably going to benefit the people who are signing the deal more than it's going to benefit you, you as the people. Um, and, and really selling Latin America America on, you know, on the importance of dealing on a level playing field with, with transparency. Um, and I think related to that is working with our partners to, to insist on, on a better mechanism for uh, planning, for framing what they need. I remember when the Varela government uh, uh, went after uh, spending $4.1 billion of the Panamanian people's money on a bullet train that appeared nowhere in the Panama 2030 logistics plan. Um, you know, if, if you take the shiny thing that the Chinese want to offer you rather than the thing that, that you believe it will systematically bring value added to your country, um, then at the end of the day, you're, you're going to get you know what you what you plan for, um, and so there are a number of areas where I think the U.S. Uh, whether it's working with the Corps of Engineers, to the Department of Commerce, or, or others, um, to help our partners, you know, to, to frame the requirement planning process, and we have to be credible as as neutral actors. It can't be seen as just an anti-China thing, um, but also in terms of contract evaluation, uh, the Chinese are very very good in terms of bureaucrats and, and rigging deals with contractual clauses to to make sure that they get paid one way or the other. Um, you know, we need to have um, you know sometimes it's it's the detail of of technical sophistication in the evaluation of, of competing bids. I remember uh, Route 32 in Costa Rica. Um, it didn't look so attractive for the Chinese to do it once you realize that they didn't include certain important things like like guardrails and, and the extra berms on the side of the road. Um, you know, and also it's it's uh, working to help our partners to enforce laws. Um, so it's uh, you know things like uh, labor law compliance. It's not that the Chinese are unique in in blowing past labor laws and, and cutting corners on on the environment. Um, oftentimes, uh, just in the famous uh, Chinese saying the um, you know, the emperor is far away and the mountains are high. Oftentimes the Chinese companies get away with things more because they're not as vulnerable to things like we have in the United States, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And so helping work with our partners to do that. And that's not going to stop China, but it will make the relationship a little bit healthier. Now, there are certain areas in which, uh, you know, it is a strategic risk. And anybody that runs a, a company or works as a strategic planner in a company, no, you say there's certain areas, if our if our competitors get this, it's 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 really bad news. And so there's certain um, in terms of the digital space, the competition for standards, et cetera, where you know we need and thoroughly agree with, with my colleagues, work with like-minded partners um to help, you know, it might not be a US solution if there are no US companies there, but it might be working with Ericsson, it might be working um, you know, with Nokia, it might be working um, you know, on the um the financing or, or support side. With uh, with Quika on the Korean side or, or, or JBIC on the Japanese side, um, working together to, to try to at least make sure that this is in the hands of, of um, you know, actors that fundamentally respect you know IP. Um, as was also pointed out, it's it's communicating better. It's not just communicating China bad, China bad, China bad. Um, but it's but it's uh, you know through um, other academics and, and it's through communicating with with multiple audiences. Um, as Julio pointed out, um, you know this is how what China is doing is affecting you and, and your society. Um, but also this is the empirical evidence of, of the track record, um, you know, that, um, you know, you may not get the benefit that you expect in terms of the record of, of Chinese doing a community consultation, which is always a, a deal killer in many parts of, of Latin America. Um, you know, you might not, you know, get you know, with respect to uh, the, the, the political violence that, that can accompany some of these new, new projects. And, and so really, a 
allowing, as, as Julio pointed out, uh, our, our counterparts to make better decisions about what is good for them. Uh, we at the end, as Julio points out, and I thoroughly agree, um, we need to have a dialogue uh, about, um, you know, we're here, you know, we're the gringos, we're here to help. Um, yeah, but the, the important thing is it needs to be a dialogue about what is best for them and not what is best for, for, for the U.S. Um, and I think part of that also is, is frankly, um, the tools that we've brought to the game um, are broken. Um, yes, we do need to put some resources into the game because you can't just talk without having resources. You, you need both. Um, but also, you know, things like, for example, um, USAID and the um, and the investment and economic promotion portion of, of USAID, in, in addition to just the um, you know helping alleviate fundamental human needs. Um, and how does that better plug into other things like Development Finance Corporation? How does DF, um, the problem with DFC? Um, there's a lot of good things that we want to do in terms of protected communities in terms of low-income countries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we can't use a tool that's designed to channel private sector investment like, like DFC and force it to be a social engineering tool. We have to, if we're trying to make private capital go in certain places that are strategically beneficial to us in the competition with China, um, you know, we need to say, okay, um, you know, if we want these other things, maybe we need a different tool for that. But, um, and similar thing, and again, as Julio knows well, um, the IADB does a lot of good work, um, but just like with the, um, just, just like with the World Health Organization and others, the Chinese are consummate bureaucrats with a very small, um, basically stake at the table, um, subtle ways of, of, you know, well, can you rethink the, what that report says? Maybe that's a little bit too critical to, towards China. Um, can you rethink that or oh we've got th this new project that's going to be sponsored can we create a co-financing fund or or can we um you know maybe a position the chinese company to to best win a part of this and so the risk is the institutions that were meant to be transparent alternatives to china um we need to be very very careful are not hijacked by china it's not that china can't play at that game but we need to be very clear-headed about about what we're doing um and so there's it's there's no easy solution. It's a, it's a range of solutions. But but at the end of the day, and I agree with, with both Pedro and Julio, we need to be realistic about where it's legitimate and where it's not. Um, and frankly, we need to be a better partner. And that needs, and I thoroughly agree with what Julio also said, um, you know, the idea of, um, you know, and, and I'm not sure if, if uh, you know, you know the, the history of uh, noviazgos, uh, of, of relationships, um, you know, I'm not sure you know, how, how deeply Latin America ever was in love with this. It, always, it was always kind of a, you know, hot and cold relationship. Um, but, but at the end of the day, we do need to sell the concept of values. We do need to sell the, the idea that there's something inspiring about the United States um, and, and not just make it transactional. So, um, and, you know, frankly, accepting that, that we have some very real impediments in our own political system right now, getting to that, getting to that point. But it's fundamental that we do values, um, that we do what's in Latin Americans' interest. We have a good counteroffer and we fix the tools that are broken when we come to the board to compete. Thank you, Evan. Well, we are uh, we are quickly running out of time. Uh, we could uh, I, I know that we could uh, keep discussing this for a while, but uh, I, I see quite a few common threads in um, in um, in the recommendations. Um, the need for the need for a focused strategy, um, the need to emphasize values, um, the need to work with others. Um, there's several others, but uh, I think we have. Um, I think we have uh, lots to continue to discuss in the future, uh, but I want to I want to end by thanking uh, each of our panelists, um, Evan, Pedro, and Julio, and also Miles um, uh, and Shane for the introductions. Um, we're gonna um, we're gonna wrap up here, but thanks, and we will uh, hopefully continue this discussion in the future. Thank you.